I think that prior to our generation, every other generation before us was able to look to their parents and grandparents and see a lot of hope that if you just work hard, if you get the education and you work hard, you can achieve X, Y, Z. You can have the house. You can essentially dream up whatever future you want. And I think our generation was the first where you could play by all those rules. You can fill that template exactly how you saw it done by your parents and you have it much, much harder and you can't afford the house and you can't put together a, you know, a savings that's meaningful and you worry constantly about the future and it affects things like, can I start a family? Am I, am I able to afford kids? Like, how do I pay for my future? And that's what's really, really sad because I think our generation is really one where there was an, an inflection point. So we need to rise up but in a peaceful way. And that's why I love Bitcoin because it's this peaceful revolution where we can just sort of opt into this different system and create a much more abundant, flourishing future for all of us. All right, Natalie Brunel, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I've been following your journey and I have to say you've been one of the inspirations for me to start a podcast and be on YouTube and stuff. So it's really fun to, uh, to talk to you. And yeah, before we started, I already shared, I'm always really impressed when, when I see you on like CNBC, you know, just trying to orange pill all these people with still, you know, the, the, the critical questions. And I think you're doing a great job at that. So I think that's really cool. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really grateful that the internet has opened up the possibility for me to even do this work and, and you're doing the same and, and always happy when I have the chance to go on air and talk about Bitcoin. Yeah, awesome. So I wanted to start with actually last week, or it was this week, I saw this new stat that the American interest payments have crossed the defense budget. And I'm not historically uh, informed about the significance of that, but I saw some someone tweet about, you know, this is this is a very bad, bad thing. And I wanted to start with a question about, you know, how do you think this global rising debt and of course you know america as as the prime example has impact on you know the future of millennials and their financial prospects? Well, first of all, it's a situation that's completely unsustainable. And the only reason that we're able to keep piling on debt in this way is because the United States is the global reserve currency and we can just issue more dollars. And I think the biggest problem is that people really don't understand how pernicious of, of a tax that is, especially on younger generations. It's, it's a great privilege and it's the deficit without tears when, when it starts, right? You can print all this money, finance all the social programs you want, help get yourself elected and, and all of that. But as you zoom out and as the, as the deck decades roll by, you actually see how detrimental it is because you've enriched one portion of the population, a very small portion, at the expense of everyone else and the entire working class. And, and no one knows this because they don't teach you how the financial system works in school. Most people have very little financial literacy. And so they assume it's political causes or, or, or they, or they think that the symptoms are actually the problems. Whereas if you really dig into to how money works, how money's issued, and how much the supply has increased and where that money has gone, you realize that that inflation has been the great crisis of our generation. And what is the solution? Well, I, given the title of your podcast, uh, I think we agree <laughs> that Bitcoin is the solution. We need to return to a form of money that is hard and scarce and one that can't be manipulated. And I think that is what will help us rebuild our global economy on strong Longer footing. Yeah. So what is your go-to mental model in explaining then the significance of Bitcoin and how it might be a life raft for our generation? Well, I've learned over the over the past few years that you have to deliver the message differently depending on the audience. Even when you think about here in the US, generally people understand the idea of savings or people have their 60-40 401k retirement portfolio. And they sort of take for granted that it's much more difficult for people in other countries to be able to save. And they, they have currencies that are collapsing at much faster rates than the US dollar and inflation rates that are much, much higher. So depending on the audience, you're going going to have to deliver Bitcoin in, in a different and unique way. I, I like 
I like what Jeff Booth always preaches, which is that you have to meet people where they are and really discover what their pain point is. Because again, if you're someone who's struggling or living paycheck to paycheck, that's a different pain point and reason why you would be interested in Bitcoin than someone who's maybe very, very wealthy and has succeeded in the fiat system, but maybe should look to protect their savings and diversify a little bit into Bitcoin versus those who truly need the freedom technology aspect, the ability for you to take this asset with you if you need to flee or if you need to subvert an oppressive government or regime. So so there are very different use cases all over the world, which makes Bitcoin really special because it does bring all of us together and everyone finds Bitcoin from very different backgrounds. And yet all of us benefit from being a part of this network. Yeah. So what was your entrance? Where where did you come in? Yeah, well, I if you follow my work, you probably heard me talk about the fact that I'm a first generation immigrant. My family's from Poland. Parents grew up under communism. So I heard a lot of stories just about that way of life and that form of government and how oppressive it is and how very little social mobility exists where you really have no hope for the future and there's scarcity. And my mom talked about when I was very young, how having to stand in food lines and sometimes she would get to the front and they ran out. My grandmother had to figure out ways to interact economically with the black market in order to make some extra cash for my family. And so this is what, you know, top down control of the economic system causes. And so my family really dreamt of, of leaving and coming to America, which was this land of opportunity. And so much has changed since we immigrated here in the early nineties. I think that the golden age of America is behind us in some ways and also hopefully ahead of us if we make the right decisions when it comes to money. Um, and, and I've seen just, just, just how hard they worked and, and how much, how many obstacles were before them. They, they came here, they worked multiple jobs and lost everything in the great financial crisis. So it was like one thing after another. And that for me planted a seed and that seed was curiosity. Why did this happen? How could it happen? Why is this system so unfair and essentially bails out the people at top with, at the top when they make mistakes or take, take on too much risk? And why does the average working person suffer? and and have it harder and harder every single year. And in 2017, I found Bitcoin and dismissed it like everyone else. I, I thought it was like a stock. I thought because it's digital, it can somehow be hacked or it has a back door. And so I, I wish that I had taken the time earlier to sit down and really study it, but it took me several years. I kept going back to it and I wondered could this really be a solution? And I started to dollar cost average and allocate a little bit more and more. Um, and the Bitcoin standard was really was really transformational for me because it helped me to understand what I never learned about money, who mm -hmm. controls it, how it's issued, what money really is, and why we need to rebuild our economy with a with a money that doesn't have a monopoly over it through the state. And that's when I started my real rabbit hole journey. And eventually it turned into the podcast. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I think the dismissing it from the beginning is a very common theme. Now that you look back, do you think there was like any belief that you had or a certain construct that you believed in that just made you outright dismiss it? I mean, you had kind of the, 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 the information, you know, as, as you said, like where your parents are from. So you, so you, you knew about the problem or the need. But then there's this possible solution. Obviously, you understand that now. But like at that time, do you? Do you know yeah, what held you back there? 
Well, I think I've seen statistics even in the last couple of years or of how how skewed asset ownership is to the wealthy. And I think the average working person, they're they're busy in their job and they're taking care of their family and they're working probably harder than they've ever worked. And and there's not a lot of time to try to understand the stock market. And and over the last few decades, things have really moved into this passive investing pattern, which which is oh put you know put your money in the index funds like a diversified portfolio of companies and and unfortunately what people don't realize is that that's just tracking the rate of inflation you're basically just treading water mm-hmm. and so for me you know growing up I knew my parents background they were always big savers but they were afraid of the stock market you know something like the Nasdaq didn't exist in Poland they didn't invest in the stock market where they grew up and so I think they were very afraid of it. And people who didn't invest in the stock market, I mean, those people either made money if they made the right picks, or at least they kept pace with inflation. The people who just saved in cash didn't do very well. And unfortunately, my parents got a home again, right before the bubble popped, the financial crisis of 08, 09, where the housing bubble came down. So real estate wasn't a way that they were able to build wealth. So for me, I think it was just, I was afraid. I was afraid that if I choose the wrong thing and that I essentially gamble and I'm and I knew my mentality was this sort of I want to make money right I want to increase my savings but I was afraid that I would lose it if I picked the wrong thing and I had to study Bitcoin I had to humble myself and I've realized now what so many people say on Bitcoin Twitter which is that the people who dismiss Bitcoin they just they have not sat down and done more than a couple hours worth of research yeah yeah, 100%. I think that is also a common theme. I mean, you've talked to a lot of people into Bitcoin as well. The fact that once you find this thread that triggers you where you're like, okay, this is interesting. And you kind of go down this, this rabbit hole and, you know, inevitably you end up at the point where you say like, what is money actually? You know, why was I in economics class calculating the whole time? But what was I actually calculating? You know, what yeah. is money? And The fact that, and I think you have to be curious though, like curious enough to be like, okay, if I look into this and then I realize that I never learned about it, what does that actually tell me? You know, is there, is that on purpose or like what's, what what is the goal here? Right. And then I think one of the other triggers for me, or as you mentioned also for, for your parents, like they bought a house, like they really at the wrong time, there's people that bought a house really at the right time, you know, but you know, when you grew up, you were told, okay, you get, you know, you study, you get a job, then you buy a house, etc. But profiting from, from a home or like a lot of people I've seen, you know, parents bought up and up and up, you know, they sold and then they, they, they got into a bigger house, etc. Like that is not even possible anymore. They could only do that because they were lucky. And that I was a big eye opener for me. Like, okay, you could invest or try to time the market, but it's pure luck. It's random. You know, and the people that were lucky, they said, well, I did great. You know, (laughs) of course, of course they said that. But yeah, so you read the the Bitcoin standard there. What what was really your moment? Was that learning about the money or what what really triggered you? Yeah, I mean, I think the book is fantastic. I recommend it to everyone. I think Saifedean is so brilliant and I love the books that he's written afterward. But I think for me, it was connecting the dots between the source of money creation and how that actually works and all of the symptoms that manifest themselves in society that all of us recognize and that I was reporting on, including things like this housing affordability crisis, the skyrocketing costs of education, the inability for people to retire as easily as they once could. And even things like just just the quality of our goods and services and how that decreases every year. You would think that as we progress and as technology advances, that everything would be better. And instead you find yourself going to the same stores and the same items are not made as well but they're more expensive. You, the the air, airlines that we take, it's like the services deteriorate every single year. And yet the airlines 
are making so much money. Well, actually, they're kind of bankrupt and needing to be bailed out all the time, but the CEOs make a ton of money. And so for me, it was that it was connecting those dots and not realizing that the problem, the source of the problem was staring me in the face. And I was, I was just focusing on the symptoms and, and I didn't, I didn't know that money was at the core of it. Um, so for me, that was a big moment. And going back to what you just said, I just, I think about our generation a lot. I mean, millennials. I think that prior to our generation, every other generation before us was able to look to their parents and grandparents and see a lot of hope that if you just work hard, if you get the education and you work hard, you can achieve X, Y, Z. You can have the house. You can, you know, essentially dream up whatever future you want. And I think our generation was the first where you could play by all those rules. You can fill that template exactly how you saw it done by your parents and you have it much, much harder and you can't mm-hmm. afford the house and you can't put together a, you know, a savings that's meaningful and you worry constantly about the future and it, af- it affects things like, can I start a family? Am I, am I able to afford kids? Like, how do I, how do I pay for my future? And that's what's really, really sad because I think our generation is really one where there was an, inf- an inflection point. I mean, we've seen financial crisis after financial crisis. We were kids when the, when the internet bubble popped and then we saw the housing crisis when a lot of us were graduating or in college. And then now we saw COVID and it's like one thing after another. And a lot of us feel like we can never catch up. And hope is a motivating force in economics. Jeff Booth wrote that in his book, Price of Tomorrow, which I really, really recommend. It is core to the American dream, but also this universal dream where and mm-hmm. all of us, wherever we are, that if you don't have hope in the future, what motivates you to put in the work, right? Yeah, um, and and so I think that that's what that's why it's so critical for us to change our system and and find alternatives and and really embrace Bitcoin because where we're going from here is essentially a future that lacks hope and one where we turn against one another because everyone's so frustrated and disenfranchised looking up at the ivory tower where very few people have all the wealth and are essentially telling us what to do. And so we need to rise up but in a peaceful way. And that's why I love Bitcoin because it's this peaceful revolution where we can just sort of opt into this different system and create a, a much more abundant, flourishing future for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, it's also one thing Jeff Booth told me. He said, like, you can move now. And I didn't realize that. I realized that before. I, I, I told the story many times here on the podcast, but I worked at a bank. I had a mortgage. I was 30. Then someone told me, did you know the money in the bank is not yours? And I, I, I yeah. was like pretty shocked. And then he explained to me. And then I realized, but I can just move. Like if I have this economic energy saved in this system A, and there's this other system that is, in my opinion, based on my study, provably better for me, then I can just move there, you know? And I think it takes some time before you get there. But once you understand that, like you aren't, the system that we have is not the best that we could have come up with, basically. There's now this other thing. But I also want to ask you, like, I think, I think you made a good point about millennials. Like we also had the youth, right? When we grew up, we still had all these benefits from the time before, right? So that, that was great. And now we see all these, all these problems. What I do struggle with is like we are experiencing all these problems, but we are also laughing about, you know, the bread used to be 30 cents. Now it's five dollars. Or sometimes you see a picture, right, from an airplane where they have like steak and big futons where they're like sitting. And that's funny. So what is the disconnect there? What is what is your idea around that? So we are experiencing it, but we are not doing anything about it while we are probably the most informed generation to ever live. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good point. Cause sometimes I wonder how is, how are more people not crying out? Ex- looking for exactly. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. It's funny. We, I'm hosting an event this weekend. It's like a Bitcoin educational event because I've, I've attended so many conferences, but a lot of the conferences are for Bitcoiners, right? They're by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. And if, and if you attend, you're probably already orange pilled. And I think mm-hmm. we, Globally, I think we need more 101 events and opportunities so that people could come in and start to learn about it and feel comfortable. And it was so difficult to get people to get tickets. People are just not looking at the space right now. And 
they're focused on politics or they're distracted by other things. And, and so I think that the distraction component is very strong. I think that people work really hard. And then when they're done with whatever they're doing, they want, they just want entertainment. They want something that's going to calm them down. They don't want to do 500 hours of extra research into the economy, mm. right? And they they don't know what they don't know. So I think that it's just, it's, it's just unfortunate that until you have a real pain point, you might not take the time to really study what's going on. And you're going to turn to things like venting your frustrations on social media and getting super political, or you're going to turn away from all that. And you're just going to want to be entertained by cat memes and Kim Kardashian, <laughs> you know, it's like, so I, I, unfortunately, I think it's just going to take some time because you're right. I mean, all of my friends, former colleagues, the peers in my group that I've, I've met throughout all of my experiences in life, so many of them are Bitcoiners. They just don't realize it. And they're very passionate about complaining about the current system, mm -hmm. but they, they have not taken the time yet to learn about this new one. And I hope that that changes. I think it will. I think with every cycle, there are new people. All of a sudden they notice the price and they're like, what is this thing? So I think it's just going to take time. But I, I, I agree with you. I'm surprised that this hasn't been embraced literally by our entire generation in yes. the same way that some other things have. Oh, that's so frustrating. I, I I don't know if you 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 still actively try to like orange build people. I'm like yes. I don't know. Yes, I I do try it, but it's also as you as you said in the beginning. You know, you have to figure out like where where do you start, right? And I think yeah. I have this prime example of a, a very good friend who sold his company, has a few million, has now he has one Bitcoin because I you know, begged him to basically yeah. like do this and never ever sell. But before that, we had conversations about this, right? And I said, you know, you you bent over backwards, you worked for six years on a company that you eventually sold, you got rewarded for doing all of this, right? Someone saw saw that value, gave you this money in return, right? And, you know, imagine you call up the bank and say, I want to get 100K out. What do you think happens? I thought I'm going to start there. I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin, right? Yeah. And then he's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they have it. Maybe, you know, uh, takes a few days and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, but when you call, the issue will probably, you know, someone will pick up the phone. They will probably say like, oh, what are you going to use it for? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then he said, yeah, maybe regulatory stuff, blah, blah. So it's not, and, and I said, the point I'd like to make, and I hope you see it, is that you put in all this energy and effort and you got rewarded and then you put it in a bank and now there's some random person that picks up the phone that's sitting between you and and your, your reward basically <laughs> right yeah like what do you think of that and you know he doesn't really see it as more than a nuisance like he doesn't and, and this guy is a super intelligent guy like i highly respect him but he didn't yeah like even get to that and at those moments, I'm pretty frustrated because I love this guy, you know, and I want to, I want him to get the, the problem that he has. But I don't know. That's also why that example really convinced me. It's not an IQ test. This is some, I don't know, ego challenge, something, something test, you know. Well, you bring up a really good point, actually. And I, I never really thought about this or, or observed it until the pandemic and the responses from people and how different it was. Some people were so willing to be very, very compliant and they were so eager for the government to do whatever it wanted to do or needed to do in order to just make people feel safe and for the convenience. Whereas, whereas other people rose up and said, no, you are starting to step on my freedoms and you can't do that. Uh, and there was sort of this divide that I saw for the very first time of some people who were totally willing to go with whatever they were told by the authorities versus people who questioned it. You know, who didn't necessarily just say, no, I won't do it just because it's, it was people who were questioning it and saying, you, you don't have the right to tell me this. And for me, over the last few years, it's been really impactful to go back and read Ayn Rand's works and, and really think about collectivism versus individual rights. Because I do think that we are at a point where a lot of people from the, the poorest to the wealthiest, from the smartest to the most ignorant, they they believe that collectivism is the better, more fair path. And they don't realize 
how oppressive that system actually becomes. And it scares me. It does scare me. That's one mm -hmm. thing that for my future, that's why I think we need as many freedom fighters and Bitcoiners as possible because Bitcoiners are naturally inclined to believe in the individual rights and in capitalism and in free markets. And that being sort of the, the referee on, on economic activity as opposed to a top down imposed control on you, which ultimately will take away your rights, surveil everything you do. So I, I, I think that it's an interesting time that we're at seeing this because prior to the pandemic, we really didn't have a situation like that where the government could step in and tell you whether you could leave your house, whether you could go to the grocery store, whether you had permission to do just daily things and what you could do with your body. I mean, it was, to me, it was wild. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I worry that there are going to be people in the future who, for convenience and out of fear, choose to have someone take too much control as opposed to fight for their freedom. And, and, and so that's why I think we need to get the word out more because again, Bitcoin is that tool for freedom and it is a, a representation of, of individual rights and pop property rights that actually can allow us to create an abundant future for ourselves through through capitalism through providing value as opposed to a system that is arranged and organized by a select group of people who are going to benefit immensely and tell everyone else what to do and what to think and what where they can go and where mm -hmm. they can't yeah it kind of feels to me as kind of it's a logical consequence of this debt-based monetary system right at some point either it blows up and then, you know, they uh, have to show their face like, oh, sorry, we, we blew it up. Right. And I think this this move to this more centralization, even even more. Right. Is just an attempt to to hide that what I think is inevitable. Right. I mean, in, in my previous episode, I, we talked about, you know, the debt based system is, is held up by the promise of the people that, that will pay it back. But not in this lifetime, right? Like it, it's people in other lifetime. Like that's what what they don't tell you, of course. Right. And it's like things like this that at least opened opened my mind. Uh, also, you said you just said the word someone is also something that I think about a lot. Like the government or some institution is not like one entity. It's it's individual people, and that's also why I love the idea of Bitcoin being a mind virus in that sense. Because these people work at these institutions. You know, generally they get paid more than the average person so they can buy their groceries a, a, a little bit longer, right? Like they, they yeah. will get the problem a bit later, but eventually they will see those problems or their kids will see these problems, right? And I think it's my hope, but it's also Bitcoin gives me that hope that people will start thinking about this like you. I mean, also if you probably, if you look back on your childhood and if I do, and I look at how it is here right now, it's different. You know, I cannot deny that that it's different, different in 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 a, in a bad way, and yeah, that will slowly just degrade over time, and then yeah, people people will have to notice. But what what do you think is then the main thing people need to unlearn? Well, I think most people literally don't know where our money comes from, um, and I think that inflation is only perceived by people as rising prices it's they don't even think about the expansion of the money supply it's it's crazy that we've gotten to a point where we just accept these paper promises and they're not even paper anymore right i mean hardly anyone interacts yeah. with cash and it's just electronic ledgers that someone can manipulate um i think if you walked on on the street in any city in America, and you asked a group of people who is the Fed chair or what is the Federal Reserve, more than half would probably not know the answer. I, I was one of those people. I was completely ignorant to it, even though I attended great schools. I always did well in my classes, but it's just, you're not taught the importance of that, that institution and how much influence it has, unless you go directly into, you know, finance or the business track. Mm -hmm. I was studying journalism and I, I did not understand how, how powerful the central bank is. And, and all of us recognize, right? Like who are the wealthiest people in the world? Who are the wealthiest, most powerful? Probably the majority of people would say, well, bankers, yeah. but why? 
why, right? I, I think we just need to ask ourselves more questions. It's Bitcoin is a process of learning just as much as it's a process of unlearning and becoming humble about what you didn't realize or what you thought you understood. And going back to what you mentioned earlier about how we sort of laugh at how something cost five cents a couple generations ago and today it's 30 well, why don't we question that more, right? We yeah, have exactly. this we have this complacency and we just accept the fact that prices go up. Well, why? N- not, not a lot of us sit there and go, why is a gallon of milk hundreds of percent more 20, 30 years later? Um, and so that's what Bitcoin, I think, causes all of us to do, which I think is why it's so amazing. Yeah. I think this subject for me really illustrates how big this battle basically for for money is how early do you think we still are with regards to bitcoin like how should we look at the pace of monetization of something as new and unique as bitcoin well we're extremely early obviously humans have a a time recency bias and we all think that everything is happening so slowly and we can't wait for the next thing. But when we zoom out and we realize actually how quickly everything moved for Bitcoin to do what it has and reach this market cap and reach a level of institutional acceptance, even this year, over 15 years, is just incredible. And we are still early. It's just, it's just hard because I'm certainly one of those people who think about those who got in when Bitcoin was just a couple dollars a coin or a couple hundred dollars a coin. And I, I, I'm like, wow, I really Really missed out and I the growth rate can't sustain you know that that amount that that people used to be able to enjoy every single year but but at the same time you think about the billions of people who are still not on the network or who hold mm-hmm. very very little Bitcoin and don't understand and and the global market is literally the entire world it's eight billion people very few assets have that opportunity to be owned by every single living person on this planet I mean think about that you can't be in a developing country and own fractions of shares of Apple or a house in M- Miami right but you can acquire Satoshis and so that's I think in and of itself incredible because the opportunity is so massive and we still have such 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 little adoption when you think about the grand scheme of things but of course you know i'm like everyone else i'm like darn it i wish i was earlier mm-hmm. we all wish we were earlier but but i think i think 10 20 years from now we're going to be so grateful we were in it at this point yeah i think this is a fun question how many people do you think actually understand bitcoin Nobody fully understands it, but let's say how we talk about it. I would say I would. That's a tough question because obviously Bitcoin Twitter is, I think, where Bitcoiners are the most active. There are obviously people who are Bitcoin enthusiasts and understand it who aren't on Twitter. But I would say just from Twitter, you know, Michael Saylor has like 3.5 million followers. And I would say if... I would say at least several hundred thousand of them really understand Bitcoin. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a positive and optimistic about it. I'm going to say that at least a couple million people around the world understand Bitcoin, really. I mean, we fill a room when we go to Bitcoin conferences, right? And there are, there are so many people that are passionate. So I, I think millions of people understand Bitcoin, but hopefully soon it will be billions. Yeah. So. In your view, how what what is like the impact of you know these institutional investors, more traditional finance firms adopting Bitcoin, you know the long term viability on on Bitcoin as a as an asset class? What's your view on that? Well, I'm very optimistic and very bullish on it because we do have this massive legacy financial system. And the goal, I think, should be for Bitcoin to assimilate and integrate with it and then, and then eventually maybe take over. Right. But I think, I think everything that's built slow and steady, like brick by brick is stronger over the long run. And to your earlier point, these institutions are made up of people. And for so many, it's basically been their job not to understand Bitcoin because they're so entrenched in Mm -hmm. fiat and have benefited or enriched themselves through it. So 
it just takes time and it takes slow developments and we're seeing it. And I think it's incredible what Bitcoin has already done. And I would love to have pension funds finance, you know, the, the, their ability to take care of their members through something like Bitcoin. I would love to see all financial advisors recommend it for the investors that they represent so that they start to allocate to Bitcoin. I mean, there are going to be lots of different instruments and vehicles. And I think that there was a survey, I actually just recently, I think from Gemini that some people have started their Bitcoin journey through these ETF instruments. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's it's a step through the door and eventually they want to buy spot Bitcoin and self-custody it. So I'm very bullish on it. I think it's incredible. I think it's going to usher in waves of just billions of dollars in assets under management at various firms starting to allocate toward Bitcoin, which will be great for all of us. And what I also love is just that Again, Bitcoin is great for everyone and being against it just doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't benefit you to be against it. But if you're for it, whether you're running for office or running a massive hedge fund or you're just an average retail investor, you can, you can, you know, benefit tremendously from it. So mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin is for everyone. And I, I think eventually every company will be a Bitcoin company in the same way that every company is sort of a digital company today. Yeah. Love that. Do you think the, like, what is the significance of these Bitcoin ETFs? Like, what do they signal? Do you think they are, do you see them as the Trojan horse? I mean, a little bit. I still, again, I, I always advocate for self-custody because I think it's really important for it us as individuals to have financial freedom and empowerment and to be able to be our own banks and not have any gatekeepers or intermediaries or anyone who could tell us what to do or or remove our permissions to engaging in the economy. But again, there are there are so many people out there who don't understand Bitcoin or they are part of institutions that have charters that are not able to invest in spot Bitcoin. And so they're like a step forward. It's like a little, you know, it's one breadcrumb and 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 one after another before you you eat the entire elephant. So I I I think that it's just a, a good positive move forward. And I don't think that I don't think that they're going to have any impact in terms of Bitcoin's ability to be the freedom technology of the world. I don't think that they're going like any of these institutions owning Bitcoin is not going to give them the chance to change or influence Bitcoin's protocol. They're not going to be able to manipulate and co-opt it. I just think it's important to educate people so that they they do see the value in self-custody instead of just putting all of their money into a vehicle that obviously is more monitored, surveilled, and there's a there's a price that you have to pay. There's basis points that every single year for money management fees, you you have to pay in order for them to to offer you the ETF. So I see it as a, just a net positive. Yeah. Yeah, I also think if if people start with the ETF, you know, and they have a small percentage and, and the value of that keeps growing over time. Yeah, again, as to what we talked about before, some people will become curious or triggered and be like, oh, well, what is this thing actually that's growing in my portfolio? Yeah. And then, yeah, you, you will come to that realization that the self-custody part is different, but probably will give you way more sovereignty in a sense. Yeah. But yeah, that's part of the journey because it's again, this abstraction of security, like do you have a, some sort of custodian at, at BlackRock or, or one of the others. Right. And yeah, well, if, if you take, I had another guy I talked to who said, well, but if I have 500K in Bitcoin, I need to protect it myself. I said, yeah, that's the entire point, you know, but for him, it's the first time to ever think about being that responsible, you know? So it's, it's, it's a big step. No, I completely agree with you. And for me, honestly, the biggest challenge when I meet people and try to help them understand Bitcoin, I don't know if it's just the area where I live and where I'm currently working, but so many people are, are they just think that real estate is the path to wealth now. I, I can't tell you how many times I, I hear that today. It's just, well, this home someone was able to buy and and put a little bit of money into it and flip it. And this is how much it's gone up over the last few years or since the pandemic or mm. this or that. Everyone's trying to become not just a homeowner and get themselves a nice house that will go up in value, but even potentially like an Airbnb or a landlord. or. And I just think it's wild that we 
have monetized real estate in the way that we have. Yes. Where you see a property that literally is falling apart. And it was when it was brand new in let's say 1970 or 1980, it costs like a hundred thousand dollars. And today, the same property that's going to need so much work and maintenance is like two million dollars. Mm. And I think that that's really skewed people's perception of investing and 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 saving because saving basically homes have become savings vehicles and that's i think our biggest challenge is to help people understand what's happened in real estate because your home should be a roof over your head yeah. it shouldn't be this thing that just continues to balloon out of reach for the average person and and that's something i i actually am really passionate about because i do think that property rights again are core like i want to own physical property and i think when you own a piece of property like you own your home instead of renting it from someone else you're more invested in not just that building but everything around it the community your neighbors your schools like what's happening locally and so if we actually we've moved into here in the united states a nation of renters for the most part if we move back to a nation of home owners where you own and you like you have property invested and and you hopefully, you know, have a lot of Bitcoin and maybe you borrowed against your Bitcoin to have that property and we demonetize real estate. I think, I think that that would actually be a better, it would be, it would be so beneficial to the, to the society at large. I think it would allow us to be more cooperative and mm -hmm. to, to rebuild in our local communities in a very positive way. Yeah. I think that renting versus owning is, is a very good example. Like I rent my house, but yeah, I, I am not incentivized to, you know, clean, <laughs> clean the front here yeah. beyond the garden. Right? right. And, but I also never see the owner. So he's also not really incentivized right. to do that because I just, I just pay him every month. Exactly. And also, yeah, that, that other example, right? Like a house that from the seventies that has the same utility value as in 2024, but it's like 10 times or, or 20 yeah. times more expensive. Like that is exactly also what we mentioned about the entire deflationary to true, true technology. The fact that it costs more units should, yeah. but the house is in worse shape should yeah. tell you something about the units, not the house. Right. Exactly. But yeah, I, I like now I say this like it's so logically, but I also did not understand this like uh, three years ago. Right. So Thanks. I, but I think it's a, it, it's just a good example of just these things that people take for granted and they just never really think like, what does this actually mean? <laughs> right. Like, yeah. yeah it's, it's fascinating. Well, and we really confuse price with value. Again, yeah. I think everyone thinks that inflation is just prices going up. They don't realize that it's your your money buying you less. Like the, the purchasing power is just getting squeezed out. And during that process, again, there are people who really benefit from the inflation and they have amassed so much wealth that I think it's understandable for the average person to look at that group of people and say, this is really unfair. And that was one of my biggest blunders when I was looking at the state of the world when I was in my teens and twenties is I, I thought that the, I thought that you need to redistribute the wealth. I thought you need to tax the wealthy more because again, I didn't understand. I just thought that's unfair. They don't need that much money and they should have to share it with everyone else that actually works so hard. But I didn't understand at the core how how our system worked, how incentives drive these sort of outcomes mm -hmm. and how when you have this manipulated monetary unit at the base layer, it incentivizes and creates monopolies. And these monopolies would not easily take hold in a true free market, in true capitalism. There would be a lot more what Preston calls biodiversity. There would be more true competition and real value would come to the surface as opposed to these massive, everything's mass produced. Everything has become a massive corporation, a massive industry that takes advantage of the little guy and, and grows and in, in size and takes on a ton of debt and buys back shares of its own stock and all of that. I mean, that is everywhere in our society. And I think it's contributed to why we're so unhealthy, why a ton of us are 
you know, reliant on all these medications, why you go to the grocery store and half of it is like not even edible, why our airplanes are not as nice as those steaks you mentioned earlier on Pan Am and the cozy mm-hmm. seats. I mean, every, it, it literally trickles down to everything, the construction of homes. I, I moved into a building that was three, not even three years old. And I had three instances of the ceiling coming through and flooding into my unit in a brand new building because they're putting this up cheap and fast. They just are. It's the truth. So I think, again, if you address that core unit and you remove the ability for people to manipulate it, then I think, wow, what, like, what, what could we build and create as human beings? Yeah, I think that's the hope that Bitcoin eventually also brings, right? Like where where could we actually go if we yeah. would allow, you know, all our progress to actually, you know, be applied in, mm. in, in, in the world. Yeah. I, by the way, I love like these TikTok videos where there's like these building inspectors go to like these newly built homes and they look at like all the construction stuff. Yeah, that's wild. Like yeah. very, very bad. A very bad quality. But what you said was interesting that you thought, you know, about this redistribution, tax the tax the rich, etc. I mm-hmm. of course now I, I don't think you'll be offended, but I think it's funny that that's so simplistic, right? That's yeah. how a lot of people think, oh yeah, that's what they should do. And then, you know, everything is fixed. But right. no, it's it's a certain system and you are, you know, it's a big fat club and you're not in it, you know, like that's where you are. That's where you're complaining. And the people who are in the club are happy that you're complaining, you know, keep complaining. Just if you don't talk about the real cause, then, you know, it's fine that you're complaining and you're angry and whatever, you know, like it's, it's the same as like spending time watching, you know, Kim Kardashian or, you know, there's no difference in, in that. It's just distraction. Yeah, well, and I, what I love about Bitcoin too is it actually turns greed into something that's sort of altruistic, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all self-interested. We are, we want to better our lives. We want to provide for ourselves, for our families. Like all of us have that hunger. And, but, but today you take the wealthy and you attribute it to this very, very nasty version of greed because you see all the wealth and you see all these other people struggling. And what you what you miss on that journey is how that person was able to get there. And it is because the system is so broken. And I, I, I am a true believer that if we had a, a hard money at the base layer of our economy and a currency like Bitcoin that was a currency of truth that no one could manipulate, I do not think that the wealth concentration would be as extreme. Would we still have wealthy and poor? A hundred percent. Do I think that it would be a generation of people working their behinds off, taking on two, three jobs, side hustles, this, that, while someone else is a bajillionaire? I don't think it would be that massive of a divide where so many people are disenfranchised and struggling and so few like people have literally two thirds of the wealth. I really actually think that capitalism would distribute wealth more equally, but in just like a fair, natural way, an organic way emerging through the market. That is my belief. Again, I I still think it would have, there would be a disparity, but it wouldn't be as large with so many people suffering at the bottom. Yeah, maybe this is not 100% correct, but I think that disparity would exist based more on merit than what it is now, right? Like I, I learned or at least my perception of capitalism is this example I use so much, but the, let's say we both like to bake cupcakes and we both have a store, yeah. you know, and everyone goes to your store because you're better. And yeah. after a week, I realized that I suck, you know, great, great. You know, and then I know that I'm not good at making cupcakes. I can do something else, right? And if I do that right. other thing and I realize that I'm really good at it and people want to, you know, buy my product or buy my service, you know, then I can use the the reward that I gather as capital, capitalism, yeah. to grow this thing even further, right? Yeah. And so, and if you're the cupcake queen and I don't know, the, the, the lumber king, then, you know, it's because I'm actually good at lumber and you're actually good at making making cupcakes. A hundred percent. I think that's where we eventually will go. And the fun thing, I think, with Bitcoin as like this base layer, people will try to game it always, but 
there's more incentive to just follow along. Mm -hmm. And some people will find it really hard because there are people right now that are very rich and influential who in a merit-based system wouldn't really come that far, you know? I agree. And that's, that's, that's the bigger shock. But that, again, for me is like a signal as to how big this battle is because these people are not going to give up, you know, the position that they have just, just because. So I think we still have a long road ahead of us with regards to that, but eventually it's, it's as simple as we said before, like you can vote with your money, literally just ditch one money and adopt the other money. I and then agree. you're moving away from that, you know, and yeah, and, yeah it's stupid that it's so simplistic. And that's why it's so hard to believe. I think also when you talk, when you tell that to people, right? Like, I know. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to ask you what, what is a spiky point of view on Bitcoin that not many people share with you? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, I I guess I'm just more bearish in the short term than than other people. I I I think that sometimes I hear price predictions of like a million dollars in the next 12 months. And while that would be great, I tend to be someone who's looking at the macro picture and I'm just a, a little bit nervous about the next six to 12 months because, you know, right off the top, you were talking about the interest payments. I mean, we have gone so far into debt and we have a decelerating economy globally. I mean, China's having its own issues. Japan has issues. Europe has issues. It's like all of these all of these economic factors are decelerating and, and heading toward a recession, yet we have all-time highs in the stock market. And I don't know, it's just, I, I just don't know how this is going to unravel. And I am someone who believes all roads lead to the printer, but I do think that there's going to be pain along the way. And I think that I'm someone who wants to prepare for that pain. Maybe it's my immigrant, you know, background and all the <laughs> things I've experienced, but I'm someone who's thinking like, you know, I'm going to prepare for Bitcoin going down as opposed to just assuming that it's going to do what we want it to do. And in a year, it's going to be this and that. And I just tend to be a little bit more conservative and careful. Yeah. So when you talk to people, what is like, what's like a common misconception that that you always wish to debunk? Like, what's the one thing where you're like, this is just wrong? I mean, there are so many because I talk to a lot of newcomers. So a lot of people think that you have to buy one Bitcoin. So, you know, talking to them about Satoshis and you could just buy a fraction and start to dollar cost average. That's always a big one. Another is the energy. A lot of people are very passionate about just the environment and they think that Bitcoin contributes negatively. Like we just had a negative piece that ran on NBC Nightly News talking about Bitcoin mining and attributing the noise to causing health issues with humans and dogs. And it was just... It was just ridiculous to see. And some people are worried about the fact that we don't know who Satoshi is, which it doesn't matter, but that's a hurdle for some people. <laughs> some people think that there's going to be a massive cyber attack and it's going to take down all of Bitcoin. So you have to explain to them that, you know, decentralization, there's no point of failure. So, I mean, there are so many, it's just, it just takes time. And so I try to be patient and remember what it was like for me because we all started somewhere and we all had those same questions. Yeah. And you, you mentioned these one-on-one -on -one events or the event that, that you're throwing. How do you think we can improve Bitcoin edu education and, and literacy, literacy in, in general to, you know, general public policymakers? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is what I'm really focused on. I think we just need more one-on-one -on -one content and, and I really want more people to speak up. I mean, there's a joke in the space, right? That like, we don't need another Bitcoin podcast, but actually I think that, I think that different people who have expertise and experience in different industries will bring in people who are in those industries. We all look for voices that reflect what we know. Right. Like I think that I've helped women understand Bitcoin or maybe millennials or people who worked in news or, you know, people, people like to listen to voices that they have something in common with. So we need dentists to go orange pill the dentist. We need people yeah. who are accountants who talk to the accountants and the CEOs who talk to the CEOs. I just think we need so many more people to orange pill the people that they know and are in their communities. And, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take more one-on-one -on -one information that's available and uh, more events that are geared toward the newcomers. And, and I think number go up will also obviously help. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I, I also thought of course a year ago, should I start another podcast? But then I thought, okay, 
I want to focus on millennials. That's a big enough group. And I actually see that I'm reaching them, you know, and I yeah. see people sending messages like, oh, I found you. And then I found Sailor and then I found Breed Love. And I'm like, okay, interesting, you know? So yeah. in some way it is working that, sure. you know, different people find find different people again. And I think that's uh, that's only beneficial. All right, last two short questions. What's your number one advice for millennials who want to get into Bitcoin? Read the Bitcoin standard and just download one of these wallets and, and start interacting with Bitcoin. Buy, buy your first couple of Satoshis or have a Bitcoin or send you some sats and just start engaging and, and actually interacting with Bitcoin because you'll appreciate how amazing it is, how fast it is, how cool it is that I can send value from here to any part of the world at lightning speed for very little with no intermediary. I just think it's an amazing technology and just start learning about it. It's a really fun process because it intersects with so many other studies and really interesting things, whether it's history, philosophy, physics. I mean, you end up going down so many paths of knowledge and, and I find that to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I think becoming practical is, is probably the number one thing with Bitcoin. I think about when I, when SMS was just introduced, I was on like the soccer field with my friends and we used to send text messages from one yeah. like goal to the other. And we would imagine this invisible yeah. message going through the air and then landing in the yeah. phone. Right? right. I have the same feeling with that when, when, you know, I, I know, pay my wild. barber in Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. Yeah. It's crazy. All right. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? A core belief that I will never let go. I have a core belief that we as humans all have some very powerful universal things in common, one of which is our need to connect with other people. I think I think at our core we're we're very good. We crave connection and love and I think we need to lean into that because it creates beautiful relationships and beautiful innovations and and just i th i think it's amazing i think when we when we focus on what's positive we can just move mountains and i i i really have a belief that bitcoin is something that we like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if we deserved it. I don't know if it came from heaven, but I think that it's going to help usher in an era that is the best of humanity. Great, Ender. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this. And yeah, maybe talk soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.